All right, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Please be seated. We are uh, going to continue our discussion. And we're going to move into, you know, even, even the speakers who are going to be talking are not listening. So I'm, I'm not going to introduce you if you're not going to listen. So <laughs> All right, we're, let's, let's, uh, we have a treat now. Um, we're going to move into the world of three dimensions. Although the world we're in is three dimensions, just to be true. I mean, this like this microphone, wow, check that out. It's getting closer and all that stuff. But we could do this now without having to be there. And there's some amazing technologies, although uh, it's, it presents uh, great opportunities and very specific challenges for storytellers, which uh, we're going to hear from two of the, the great uh, senior executive producers in this building. We're going to talk about some of the really cutting edge experiments that are being attempted here in telling stories outside of 2D and linear, which kind of scares me a little bit, frankly, because I like my little 2D and linear world. But uh, when you look at this stuff, it just blows you away. And, th and the way they're addressing it is very exciting. So without further ado, I uh, please welcome to the stage Rainey Aronson Rath, who is the executive producer of Frontline. Hi, it's been a great couple of days. Wonderful to see you all here. And I'm putting myself on a timer because I was told I have to stay on time. So I'm going to. Um, so I want to share a couple of stories with you and really talk to you about why Frontline is doing virtual reality in the first place. And it starts with a revolution. And the revolution was happening in my own home seven years ago with my daughter. And it was when we got the first generation iPad. Do you guys remember that? Long ago, before we understood what an iPad was, there was one in our home. And the reason was because our child was severely speech delayed. So our speech therapist, who was brilliant, said, can we try this thing called an iPad, which seems like old news now. And so my husband, Arun Rath, who's been here a lot the last couple of days, and I decided we would try this new type of technology to see if we could open up her to talking and it was a remarkable transformation for her and she did speak um, it was incredible and what we mostly noticed was how incredibly nimble her little fingers were at the age of two and they were exploring and intersecting with her media in a way that frankly we hadn't before and we decided this is pretty good you know we hadn't yet had the issues around addiction and our phones and all of this hadn't happened yet so we were really at the beginning stages of feeling optimistic about this media so our daughter's first media experience was the iPad. Her second media experience was television a year later. So she didn't watch television. And I will never forget that we put on the TV and we put PBS on. We love PBS. GBH to be specific, because we're in Boston. And she screamed at us. She tried to touch the television. She completely did not understand a non-immersive media. She literally stamped her feet and told us we were nuts. And what was this thing that you couldn't interact with? And I looked at my daughter, who was three at the time, and I was almost running Frontline at that point. I was the deputy executive producer. And I thought, wow, my own child you know, just defied my whole medium. And I walked into the newsroom the next day, and I said to our head of digital, who is this wonderful young guy I had recruited out of New York, I said to him, you know, th we, we've got a problem. You know, my daughter just defied me and really is upset with this idea of the TV set. And he looked so relieved. He said, oh my god, you're finally getting it. So that was the beginning of me basically being humbled by my own children. I'm sure if you have children, you've all been humbled. Um, that was my first humbling experience. And it was my first experience in which I knew there was a new frontier that I had to um, personally and professionally explore. And so what I did was I went to MIT. One day a week, I got a fellowship at their Open Doc Lab, which is an immersive documentary lab. They actually allowed me in, even though I come from legacy media. I mean. There were a few seminars in which people in the room had no idea what I did for a living, and they were talking from another planet about immersive media and gaming and all these new storytelling tools. And then when it would come to me and I would explain what I did, they would look at me like an alien, like, oh, wow, you guys still exist? Linear media? So again, it was my second humbling experience was really being inside the world of MIT where new storytelling was really starting to, to take off. And I had to pick a project. And frankly, 
the thing I understood the most was virtual reality, and that's because I'm a filmmaker by training. I made many films for Frontline before I became um, senior producer and then you know, eventually executive producer. And I understood that we could take a journey in time and it didn't have to be linear. So I decided to explore this medium for Frontline actually as a, as a project at MIT. Um, and we started with 360 video. Does everybody know what 360 video is in here? No, okay, so 360 video is essentially when you can film all around you. So instead of just filming in front of you, the cameras, right, and there are multiple lenses in some cases, and now cameras are getting more and more sophisticated, are filmed all around you so that when you're watching it, even in goggles or on Facebook, right, when you can watch a player, you can move around in time so you can actually immerse yourself. So as I was building this, I thought to myself, you know, probably the most important way for us to tell stories in this space is about our environment and going to places that you really couldn't go, trying to understand concepts that are really hard to understand. In other words, not every front line is going to be in VR and nor should it be. So we started a series of experiments, which I think um, some have been incredibly successful. The, the rate at which we're understanding this form has taken off astronomically. It's one thing that Frontline does. So of course we do our big documentary series, we publish in writing, we publish on Facebook, but this has really challenged us the most. And the, the film that we did with Nova is my most successful example of where I think VR has worked for, for Frontline certainly, and then Julia, my colleague at Nova will talk about how it works for, for Nova. But for Frontline, we have been struggling with how do you tell stories about climate change? How do you actually go to a place to describe what's happening to our planet and keep people's attention? In narrative terms, that's very difficult, and we could talk about this for, we could workshop about narrative for hours today. But I think instead, when a really successful frontline is published online or on air, you feel like there's a driving narrative to it. You feel like there's tension. You feel like there's character. So for us to do that around climate change has been a challenge, and we've been really, really looking for new ways of telling these stories. So when we worked together with NOVA, we were telling the story of climate change in Greenland. And we used a very specific example that you could see and feel. And so together, we felt like this was a good bet, that we could do something together. And I really hope you all will try to experience it. It's outside if you haven't already. Um, really just put the goggles on. It messes up your hair. Trust me, I have curly hair. So when you put it on, it really will disrupt your hair. But it'll go back in place. You'll be fine. And you'll have an experience that I think will be really worth it. So to give you a sense of what Frontline has been doing in addition to Greenland, I want to just share with you a couple of minutes of different environments that we've been filming in 3D and places that we've been journeying. And then I'll introduce the next speaker. So we'll show this now. Experience Frontline in virtual reality. Journey through the heart of the Amazon in search of ancient ruins. To the oil fields set aflame by ISIS. These are the Qayyar oil fields. They've been burning for the last two, three months. We have 20 displaced people living in our home. If some of us don't have food, then we share what little we have. It was Mother Nature looking to eat not only my family, but my community up. First, we had sirens. Medical department number 126. Step inside the story. Years of it drove a relatively sane young man insane. Explore the clues of real life mysteries. See the world from a new point of view. Open your eyes to Frontline. 
So those were amazing linear promotional people making this incredible video, to be clear. So we've, we've really worked hard to how do we describe our work in linear as well. Everything we do that is in Frontline VR, we're also doing 360 versions of it that will be um, on Facebook. So we're trying as much as possible in the public media realm to make sure there's access. And just a word about the, the environment at GBH has been incredibly supportive of this type of innovation. And actually, you know, WGBH doesn't have to be. You know, we're really big leaders in other spaces, but the fact that they really engaged with Frontline and also with Nova and supported this effort was really valuable to someone like me who's really looking at how do we sustain storytelling for other generations as they come and, and people who are curious about this as well. Um, so now I have the honor of introducing Julia, who is amazing, and she's my colleague at NOVA. She's the deputy executive producer and has been very closely involved with our film about climate change in Greenland and um, a really great editorial and creative partner to us. Thank you so much, Rainey. And I have to just uh, express my appreciation once again to Rainey and everyone at Frontline who welcomed us and Nova to this creative process, and we learned so much from them. So as Rainey was saying, everyone here, Nova, Frontline, American Experience, everyone at WGBH wants to tell compelling stories. And we all have our own challenges, and for Nova, when we are trying to share scientific data, that can be particularly challenging. And this is a little example. So this is the Fimble Glacier in Greenland, or actually more accurately, it's where the Fimble Glacier used to be. But this image is not really very user friendly. So we wanted to, with this VR, the whole idea is to take you to Greenland so you can feel what it's like to stand next to a glacier, so you can see how they're changing in a visceral way, and you can meet the scientists and try to understand what they're doing, how they're doing it, and trying to figure out why the glaciers are melting so fast. So this is a 360 rig. As Rainey mentioned, you can make a 360 film, and um, Rainey's producer, Frontline's producer, Catherine Eupin, went to Greenland and shot some amazing, spectacular footage in 360 at all these different locations. And uh, if you wanted to make just a 360 film, this is what you would need to do. But what we were doing with this project, we actually did make a 360 film, but in addition, our big project outside that you can experience is a walk around virtual reality experience. And this is actually a three-dimensional virtual environment that you can move around in. So you are in control. Uh, with a 360, you can look all around in a circle, but the camera is where the camera is. It doesn't move. But our experience, walk around, you move. You change perspective. So in addition to the 360 footage that was shot, there was a lot of other more complicated things done, including photogrammetry. So all these environments, there's a series of environments in the experience, uh, both outside at glaciers and then on research boats, in research planes, and crews had to go and meticulously photograph all these environments, thousands and thousands of still photographs, which are then stitched together over three-dimensional models to create these spaces which are completely authentic. So then, as if that's not complicated enough, we wanted to put three-dimensional people inside of them and this is a studio run by a company called 8i out in California. And the person standing in the middle is our NASA scientist, Josh Willis. And um, he is surrounded, if you see on those poles, these little black things, and those are all cameras. And there are dozens of cameras surrounding him, shooting him from dozens of perspectives. This is a monitor that we're watching. Um, this just has 14 of the views of the dozens. So then again, these are all stitched together. It's video. So if you remember in Matrix, people jump up in the air and the camera spins around them. 
but they weren't moving, kind of time froze. This is videogrammetry, so three dimensions, 360 degrees of a moving, talking person. So then the person is, again, stitched together from all these different views. A three-dimensional model is made of the person, and they're put in the three-dimensional space created through the photogrammetry, and the 360-degree footage is wrapped around them. So you can see the you know, total environment. So I'm going to show you, I hope that most of you get to go and experience this because nothing I put on the screen will touch <laughs> what the experience is like. It will be a tiny, I'm going to show you just a tiny window of what you see during one of the scenes. Um, but you can see some of these elements starting to come together and I hope um, what you will feel when you're in there is this visceral connection to the environment and to the process. So I'm just going to play a little bit. Fable Glacier didn't used to be that far. It used to be much, much closer. In fact, about 100 years ago, it was right here. The glacier retreated more in the last 15 years than in the previous 70 years. We'd like to know why. This is why we came here. We think climate warming has something to do with it, and not just air temperature, because air temperature is not enough to explain this retreat. We think something is happening down below in the ocean. So that's just a tiny taste, but um, for us, I would say at NOVA, this is nothing new. We have been making digital interactive experiences for students and for kids and for teenagers for many years. And we see this just as another tool in the toolbox for making uh, science and science learning more engaging, more playful, more immersive, and more effective. So we have mobile apps, we have about six Nova Labs, and these are all gamified, immersive experiences controlled by the, the um, user, um, exploring real scientific data, analyzing it, working with it, trying to solve problems. So again, we're really excited about VR, about augmented reality, and the potential this has to really engage people in science and the scientific process. Thank you. All right, so uh, Julia, don't uh, stay close to the microphone there. Um, so, um, Bring Rainy yeah, up Yeah, and Rainy, Rainy, come up there. So, so uh, one of the things that, uh, as I've thought about uh, bringing along, and I've brought along these cameras on occasion on assignment, and normally w the way it works out for me is it seems like a really nice, cool, augmented kind of a sidebar to a primary story. A and for me, it, spending 35 years thinking about, oh my gosh, that's the best picture, we're going to start with that. Uh, and I'm going to have this great little phrase here, and I'm going to have this good little sound bite here. And I, I like being in control of that. I really like that. And uh, you lose all control in this space. So it really requires an entirely different kind of storytelling. I guess my question is, are we limited to sort of that kind of experiential moment? You know, you're sitting on the glacier and this is kind of cool and take this all in. Or can we, can we think about more traditional kinds of journalism like a fr you would expect from a frontline or a NOVA in this context? And if so, how do you drive people through that process so they, they, they go to the right place at the right time? Okay, because you're in the building, you have to come and see something in progress. We're doing an investigation in VR. And I have to say, um, it's been one of the most difficult things to do well. It's taken us about three or four times as long to do that film as it has an immersive experience. It's sort of a natural experience for VR. Um, but we figured out how to go from scene to scene narratively, and we use um, traditional techniques like narration to drive you forward. And it's working, but it is completely in the beta phase. And, the mm -hmm. and actually, something I want to say, why we're also in this space is I believe it's really important that journalists are in 
innovation spaces like this because we bring our editorial standards inside the spaces we're making things. So it's very easy for a gaming company, not easy, I should say, ever to do anything ever, but it's easier when you don't have to follow editorial standards to create an immersive journalistic environment. You can't do that without following journalism rules, so it's been it's been very challenging and, and limited in that sense. So we're learning what works and what doesn't. I would just say, as Rainey was saying with her daughter, there's a generation of people who don't want you to be in control. They want to be in control. So I think we're preparing ourselves. Curse them, <laughs> curse them, <laughs> a pox upon them. But so th I think the idea is here is that you can offer, that you can offer, offer them a world to yeah. explore um, where they can be in control, but obviously you have provided the material there for them to explore and learn about. Before we curse them, I want to just say, <laughs> humbly, <laughs> so uh, no, I do see a difference even in our office. So Carla Boras, who runs um, a lot of our digital video, you know, she's always checking us on the linear storytelling door to say, you know, other people experience media differently and um, if we can do this intelligently, so we can do it with trustworthy storytelling and VR, it could be interesting to see how that's used for education. I've wondered myself, you know, maybe I would have e even gone into science had I learned this way because I'm a visual learner, right? So there's all sorts of ways and why I wanted to work with Nova so much was because I felt intuitively that there was such a potential for math and science and learning in this space because I didn't learn the traditional way for math and science. And I think it would be amazing to see how we can just bring in more people who are more visual learners. So that's the earnest answer. Yeah. I mean, you sort of, to a certain extent, you have to think like a, a game designer, don't you? Yes, you I know, think that's right. I mean, it, are you tempted platform. to have trapdoors and a yeah. gun so you can shoot people? I mean, just, just to keep things moving no along? No shooting <laughs> yet. I mean. Actually, we went into the ISIS tunnels, and that was one of the more interesting experiments where we brought 360 cameras inside ISIS tunnels to give you a sense of how sophisticated they were. How sophisticated ISIS's engineering has been in their escape hatches. So that was a pretty great way of showing people how you know, the new battlegrounds of in, in that area were being fought. So can you imagine a day, either of you, when, when this is all we do, as opposed to, you know, the, the, the main kind of stuff we do? I, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that, but what do you think? Um, I'll, I'll say no, because I think there was always, you know, a place for once upon a time. And, you know, still, if you all have children or you have nephews or, or nieces, you know, they still love being read a story, right? There's still a time and place for watching and learning and reading, and I don't believe that ever goes away. I right. agree. Okay, excellent. Thank you both Is that very reassuring? Much. <laughs> yeah, that makes me feel a little better. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Do we break now, or we're we taking a break? What are we doing? Right away. Oh, oh, we're going to do the, uh, the, the, the shame of the cities, or the future of the cities. Or it could be the shame of the cities. I don't know. So hang on. I can't remember who's coming up first. So now we're going to look at, at cities and the problems that they're facing. I'm sorry if I didn't have my little notes ready. And uh, so um, we're going to begin with Giulio Boccoletti. Uh, he's with the Nature Conservancy, and he's going to, um, he is first, right? Yeah. He's, I apologize. For, uh, he's going to tell us about cities and water. We talk a lot about water issues in our world and, and the fact that there's, uh, I think at least a billion people don't have access to clean water in, on the planet. I may be low on that number, but we seldom think about it in the context of cities, and I think that's where Julio is going to talk. So um, please welcome him to the stage. This here. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you to uh, WGBH. I need to get my uh, series right. Um, Right, so I'm going to talk about water and cities, and um, there's many angles I could have uh, chosen to take here, and I've chosen a particular one because in part of my interest and because of the uh, world I inhabit. Um, and it may be that I tell you some things that you've heard uh, uh, again uh, already today, but, uh, but hopefully they'll be helpful to contextualize the discussion in cities. I'm a water person primarily. I spend a lot of time thinking about water security, uh, and so I can't really... Uh, start a story about um, kind of cities without first starting with a story of water. And you may have heard this before, but I'll start here. Imagine you, you take the planet and you coalesce all of the water on it away, and then you put it all in a bubble, 
and you ask yourself, well, how big is that bubble? And uh, it turns out that it's, it's like that. This will not be surprising to you. Uh, in fact, uh, most of that is seawater. Again, not surprising to you. If you take out all of the seawater, uh, you end up just with the fresh water on the planet, and that's how much fresh water we have. Now, two-thirds of that is locked in the ice sheets you just watched in the virtual reality thing. So Greenland, East and West Antarctica uh, have about two-thirds of that bubble, and then a third is uh, in rather inaccessible um, groundwater aquifers. So in fact, what we have at our disposal to use, and now you'll have to squint to see it, is that. You see that? Okay. So, so that's the fresh water that's available to humanity to use for all of our uses. That's the shallow groundwater, the lakes, the rivers, and so forth and so on. Uh, now, it's not uh, scarce in the same sense that oil is scarce, right? This water's been there all the time. Any water that you drink has been through the kidneys of some dinosaur at some point. Um, but uh, it's certainly finite, and it does matter where it is. And how we experience water uh, is a function of where that very tiny speck of water is. I'll come back to this. Let me tell you about cities, um, and I thought I'd start by telling you my own experience. Uh, so despite the fact that I sound like a character out of Downton Abbey, I'm actually Italian. Um, and I, I come from uh, the northern plains of Italy, from a valley called the Po Valley. The Po River is the, well, if I be grandiose for a second, it's the Mississippi River of Italy, except that it's much, much smaller. Um, <laughs> And the, uh, the valley, the Po Valley, has been inhabited for about 7,000 years. We have, uh, we have evidence of settlements um, for 7,000 years. The first settlements that we have archaeological evidence of are from the, uh, from the Bronze Age, 1500s to 1,000 in the case of Italy, where we actually start seeing drainage infrastructure as settlements appear. And then you get into the Iron Age of Italy, which is around 500 BC, uh, the Etruscans, for those of you who like history, and there you see quite substantial settlements and, and again more and more drainage and more kind of water infrastructure appearing. But it's only really uh, in the second century uh, BC that you get the Romans. The Romans take over this part of the country from the Gauls and they start really draining at scale primarily to turn this into an agricultural landscape and so that little kind of gridded area that you see there, that's all the centurations that the Romans built to have uh, uh, the colonies move there um, and to make space for roads. Now, I come from Bologna. That's also when most of the cities of the part of the country were, were established, and Bologna is right there. Um, and so it was established around the first century BC, but it only really came into its full uh, kind of uh, force and in, in, in its full shape that we see today around the uh, 11th and 12th century um, during the sort of first renaissance of, uh, of uh, Europe. And the reason it did that is because of water. It's because of water. So if you went around uh, Bologna today, I don't know if any of you have been there, you'd be hard pressed to know that there is any water in the city at all. Um, it's an inland city like many in Italy. Uh, you'd be surrounded by medieval buildings. But in fact, unbeknownst to most people, even in that city, there's a vast system of canals under the city that was built in the 12th and 13th century to draw water in from the river nearby and innovate the city. And then this canal, uh, these canals would convey water into ducts that would go straight in the basement of hundreds of buildings into the city that housed this, construct, this con con contraption. Uh, this is a, a silk water mill, which is a great invention of the 12th century in, in Italy. And it was, in fact, the first mechanized system of production for textiles. And you, the water would come into the basement. You could see the water mill at the bottom there. It's a vertical wheel. And it would power this massive uh, piece of infrastructure that would actually be housed on three stories. And, oops, my phone has fallen, apologies. Uh, would be housed on three stories uh, and would have 4,000 bobbins going on uh, uh, all at once. And this would produce tons of silk uh, in a year. In fact, I have a little video here of the model going. Um, this was an industrial revolution, and I, I'd like to point out it was an industrial revolution that happened 600 years before the steam engine. And it turned the city into the Saudi Arabia of textiles. And in fact, if you look at any paintings um, of the 14th, 15th, 16th century and you see silk in them, likely the silk came from this, uh, this type of production. And so Bologna saw its economic development essentially based on its ability to harness uh, to harness water. And so all of the city that you see around today, the wealth of the city, 200, 300 years of accumulated wealth were the result of the management of water. 
I say all of this because the theme of water and cities is really a story of economic and sometimes sustainable economic development. The question of how cities develop in the landscape is really the theme of my, uh, of my remarks today. Now, I grew up in Bologna, so I uh, was here uh, watching TV and watching documentaries that you probably produced. Um, and in fact, it's, uh, you know, it's it entirely fair to say that if I'm standing here today, it has a lot to do with these documentaries that I was watching. You know, bless David Attenborough, I thought I was going to become uh, an explorer or a, a naturalist. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, alas, I didn't. But I didn't fall off uh, far off the mark because uh, I ended up becoming a physicist. Uh, and then I came to this country. I spent some time here and then ended up down the street from here at MIT, where I was a geophysical fluid analyst and a climate uh, theorist, um, which is an eminently unemployable skill outside of climate science. I'll come back to that. Um, and I studied uh, the climate system uh, in all of its complexity, and we could spend a lot of time talking about that. But one thing that I took out of that experience that was sort of interesting to me was, again, the importance of water in shaping the climate that we experience. Right? And here's my very, very simplified version of that uh, rather complicated story. Um, so you're on a planet, sun shining. The sun shines 170,000 terawatts of energy down to us. That's the rate of its joules per second, right? That's the rate of energy that comes down on the sun. Now, to give you a sense of scale, um, because scale matters in this story, our entire primary energy use, so the economy of the planet, all of our oil, coal, gas, renewables, all that stuff for power, for transport, etc., amounts to 13 terawatts. Okay? So we are sitting on a vast, vast energy and thermal machine, the size of which is incommensurably larger than, uh, than our own economy. One of the interesting things about this uh, energy transfer is that when the sunlight hits the uh, surface of the planet, a lot of it is intercepted by water molecules and the water then evaporates up in the sky and releases that heat as it rains back down. So this, uh, this energy system, this thermal machine, is connected to a large hydrological system that flows up and down in the atmosphere to the tune of 4,000 billion cubic meters per week. Okay, that's water that's going up and coming down again. Now again, to give you a sense of scale, uh, we on the same time scale use about 77 billion cubic meters for all of our, you know, all of our agricultural production, irrigation, all over the world, right? So I guess the message here is that we are, I mean, actually the ratio is right, we are roughly the size of a mouse compared to a bull when you're talking about um, the climate system. So often people think about water as a precious resource that we need to be concerned about, but mostly we should be concerned about ourselves. And by the way, just as a parenthetical point, you can imagine why a changing climate matters in this context. You know, for those of you who did the physics in uh, high school, you know the clausius clapeyron equation. A degree change in the temperature of the atmosphere means a 7% change in, the ab in its ability to absorb moisture. But if 7% of something that's several times bigger than us means a lot of water uh, more for, for our purposes. Yeah? So, what is the determinant of economic development? I saw that when I was growing up in, in, uh, in my hometown. And water is a vast uh, com a component of a vast system that sort of can overwhelm us. And, and indeed it does. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about Ethiopia. Subsequently, I worked a lot there. This is a famous time series of the years from 1980 to 2000 in, in Ethiopia, one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, and that's uh, GDP, changing GDP growth. Okay? And that was, for those of you who know this country, from the time of the Derg regime through the Civil War into the current Federal Republic of uh, Ethiopia. And this is what rainfall looks like in the country. Yeah? So if you ever were under any illusion that water had nothing to do with economic development, you just need to look at this to realize that that's not the case. And of course, for those of you who were around and cognizant at the time, this was when you watched Live Aid, right? The famous drought. And there's other things that were going on in, at the time, but this is an important, an important point. Water is not just an environmental issue. In fact, it's mostly not an environmental issue. It's fundamentally a sustainable uh, development uh, issue. And so I was sitting in the IMP tower that you can see from the Charles River on a yoga ball, which tells a lot about the state of mind that I was in at the time, and uh, watching out in the Charles River, and I decided I can't be an academic. I can't be an academic. I mean, if these are the, the sort of issues that we are dealing with, I have to kind of swim, which gets to the point of what do you do when you're a physical oceanographer and you don't want to be a physical oceanographer anymore? 
so I left academia and I ended up in business and spent a long time in business and then ended up uh, in my current position at the Nature Conservancy. And I left academia and entered this world at a time when water security concerns were really changing shape. So I've been doing a lot of work over the years with the World Economic Forum. And for the last 10 years, the forum, which is not a hotbed of environmentalists, ranks risks to the global economy and to global prosperity. And they think of rather esoteric things, uh, you know, vulnerability to geomagnetic storms, the sorts of things that you, some of you, maybe some of you do, but I certainly don't spend a lot of time thinking about. But then you go up into things like uh, diffusion of weapons of mass destruction, maybe even major systematic failure, uh, systematic failure, cyber attacks. And these are increasing in impact and likelihood. And for the 10 years running that the forum has asked prime ministers and CEOs around the world what they think is the biggest risk to global prosperity, they've landed on water security being the highest risk. Okay, so something's going on in the, in the narrative about water over the last 10 years that's changed its place in our society. Now, and this is not surprising to you, I mean, uh, earlier we talked about uh, the hurricanes of this last hurricane series and I have here a little video of the, um, of the 2005 hurricane series. This is, this is a, um, a video uh, from NASA of uh, uh, Katrina and its formation. You'll see Katrina forming uh, back there in the Caribbean. You'll see that here in a second. Now, I remind you that uh, hurricane Katrina was so sort of extraordinary, but an average hurricane dumps in a couple of weeks as much water as Australia uses in a year and has the same power production of the entire economy of the planet, or another way of saying it is about 10,000 Hiroshima bombs. So again, this is a massive phenomenon that we are sort of mostly victims to. Um, and not surprisingly, cities that are encountered these types of problems, even developed cities, even developed cities in the most rich part of the country, in the rich part of the world, can face these kinds, of, uh, these kinds of effects. And of course, they also disproportionately fall on the more vulnerable uh, in, in, in those countries. And in fact, statistics about people that have been affected by this large water system that we're talking about have been quite sobering. Over the last uh, eight, nine years, um, UNDP has made some statistics on the people displaced by natural catastrophes, and particularly focusing on the question of how much are water related, floods, droughts, hurricanes like uh, Katrina. There's an average 25 million people a year that get displaced by natural catastrophe related to water. Last year, we displaced about 26 million people. That's the same number of people that were refugees from uh, war. So again, you know, just in terms of context, this is a, is a very major, very major issue. Okay, now I'll bring it back to cities. So I told you about my experience in Bologna. Water is a kind of determinant of growth. Has been for thousands of years. That's how we've uh, developed uh, water. I've told you how the changing landscape of water and I'll take you back to a place in this country. I could have chosen many examples, but I'll give you this one. Santa Fe, New Mexico. In fact, the Rio Grande Basin in, uh, in New Mexico. Um, so the Rio Grande Basin in New Mexico uh, serves two important cities, Santa Fe and Albuquerque, where you have about a million people. Now, in, uh, I think it was the 26th of June, uh, 2011, uh, a fire ignited uh, near Los Alamos. Um, it was a pretty major fire, and uh, in 14 hours, it burnt uh, 43,000 acres uh, of land. This was a highly, highly combustive event. It has a lot to do with how the forest was managed in that part of the state. And uh, the result of that was that six weeks later, as the fire exhausted itself and it started raining, the rain dropped onto this and washed all the ash and sediment down uh, bringing with it debris, bringing it with its sediment ash towards the Rio Grande River. Uh, what you see here is a video of the beginnings of that. In a few minutes, you'll see how much it accelerated. Uh, and of course, the, uh, you know, this also, by the way, brought with it uh, buildings. It eventually actually overtopped uh, uh, several buildings. And you can see here the scale of the, um, of the problem. Now, what ended up happening was uh, that a day later, this is what you got at the mouth of the Colorado. This is a 70 foot deep plug of, uh, uh, of sediment that, uh, that ended up at the end of the canyon of this particular river. And then further down, this is the area of the complete burn, further down you had a reservoir that served Albuquerque and this is what the reservoir looked like uh, two days after the, um, two days after the, the, the storm. Now, contextualizing the water system of the city, 
well, again, you have these two cities, Santa Fe and Albuquerque. They get their water. Um, there's also, pardon me, there's also an agricultural area just back down there at the, at the, at the bottom right. Uh, they get their water from the Rio Grande, brings water, essentially a natural pipeline that comes in from Colorado. Uh, then uh, Santa Fe uh, gets uh, pipeline, pipes water from the Rio Grande into its own uh, utility. Uh, there is then a transfer uh, up from the Swan, uh, San Juan uh, Chama uh, water project that is piped into another tributary of the Colorado, uh, of the Rio Grande, it comes down there, and then it sort of connects down to Albuquerque. So you can see that the fire happened right at the heart of the utility structure, uh, the water utility structure of these two cities, right? And it's for this reason that then these cities got the water on the right rather than the water on the left. In fact, the result of this thing was that Santa Fe didn't have water from these sources for 20 days, and Albuquerque didn't have water for 40 days. Right, and this is in the richest country on the planet, uh, by the way. Uh, how do you solve this? Well, it turns out, and this is going to be kind of the closing remarks uh, here in a, in, a few, in a couple of minutes, uh, it requires us realizing that the story of cities is actually not the story of cities at all. It's the story of cities and their landscapes. And the question is, how do you organize and how do cities participate in managing those landscapes? Here is the, and the complexity is, is significant. Here is the m property map of the same watershed. Who owns water? in that watershed, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but you can see the complexity of the ownership of this. It's a classic common resource pool problem you know, of the likes that Anna Rostrom got her Nobel Prize on. How do you manage collectively a resource like that when it's not just about the city, it's about the, uh, it's about the entire landscape. You know, 70% of Americans, if you ask them, where does your water come from, they'll tell you, my tap. And then the remaining 30% tell you, I don't know. Right? But this is where the water comes from. This is the watershed that it comes from. And this is the kind of collection of the cast of characters that even if you're living in Albuquerque or, in, or Santa Fe, you, you need to worry about. If you think that this is, uh, oh, sorry, and this is how you then organize, you then have to get the city to engage in the process of managing the landscape, managing fire, managing restoring streams, uh, forest thinning, um, and rehabilitating floods uh, and, uh, and floodplains. Okay? Now, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come to a closure, but I'll give you just another example because you might be left with the impression that I told you the story of Bologna, I told you the story of uh, how water has changed, I've now shown you a very real example of how this r becomes reality in, in Santa Fe. You might think this is all a developed country problem and I'm sort of telling you a story that has very little to do with that part of the world. And so this is Nairobi. Uh, sort of Nairobi. I don't know if any of you have been to Nairobi. It's an extraordinary city. It's one of the largest uh, informal settlements in Africa, in fact, the largest, second largest, Kibera. Um, Nairobi gets its water from the Tana River, big, big river system, bigger than the Rio Grande. And uh, what's happening in the Tana is that there are 100,000 smallholder farmers that live on the banks of this river. And as they farm, uh, they release topsoil, and every time it rains, you'll know that uh, Kenya is a monsoonal country, every time it rains, this topsoil washes into the river and uh, produces uh, a slimy sort of uh, sediment-rich river that then flows down into Nairobi, and Nairobi has only one treatment works, which is typically overwhelmed. And so this uh, problem in the watershed ends up actually clogging up the water supply of Nairobi, and you end up having, again, typically the most vulnerable, having to find other means of procuring water. Uh, and so well, that's where you get sort of jerry cans running around, you get people trying to procure water from the so-called tanker mafias. And this, of course, leads to enormous amounts of problems both from a public health perspective as well as from an economic perspective. I could tell you more about this story, but uh, I'm running out of time. So let me uh, close by saying uh, these couple of things. I showed you Santa Fe, I showed you New Mexico. You might have uh, expected me to talk about water and sanitation and kind of what happens in the city, but I think one of the most important stories we can tell about uh, water and cities is the relationship that needs to be established between cities and their uh, surrounding environment. Cities don't grow on the moon. Even if we all think that we're gonna be concentrated in these urban places and 70% of us are only gonna be living in cities, these are not gonna be isolated systems by a long shot. They haven't been for thousands of years, and they won't be. I can promise you, they will need to draw water from the environment. And doing that in a way that isn't blind to what's going on in the environment is going to be really critical. The good news is that we've calculated that out of 4,000 cities that have more than 100,000 people in them, 1,000 could pay for conservation in their watersheds and protection of the watersheds simply out of the savings that they will get of not having to build additional treatment works to deal with the problems that they have been, causing, been caused. 
Another 2,000 could pay for that same if they also took into account the significant monetizable economic benefits and social benefits that come out of doing uh, interventions into the watershed in the peri-urban area. So it's a good news story, but it does need engagement, and it does need for people and political constituencies to understand this risk and this opportunity. And, uh, and so I'll stop here. Um, this is me standing in uh, the Thames. I live in London now. Um, and uh, I am not really an explorer, so I wear a suit anyway, and I end up in, in the Thames. And this was actually um, after rainfall, which if any of you know how these water systems work, is a particularly bad idea. Um, but it, it is my, uh, it, it, it really was my attempt to reach, this is 29 Magazine in Nature, and it was really my attempt at reaching other people. We desperately need people to understand where their water comes from. They desperately need people to understand they have a responsibility towards their landscape they depend on, as well as to ensuring that sustainable development is actually something that's shared between rural communities and, and urban communities. And you can only do that if you're speaking to them. So I'm standing here because I watched those documentaries all long time ago, and I'm hopeful that you know, if we get these stories right through all of you, maybe we'll be able to uh, move this and the next generation to take care of their environment for their own sake. Thank you very much. All right, Julia. Step there for one second. Step there. Step yeah. I have one question oh, for one you before you get away. So while we change the slides, so, um, so uh, water is important. We know that, right? <laughs> uh, we are what, Good about 70% water? That's us, right, yeah. Which I think means we're 30% away from drowning, right? So, <laughs> um, so that's, it's big, water's big, and yet um, it does, we take it for granted. It doesn't seem to have a constituency. You know, in some cases, maybe it's too cheap. I mean, what, what will it take for people to, I mean, seeing that graphic with that tiny little ball of water yeah. certainly makes me thirsty. Yeah. But I, I wonder what it would take to um, ch raise this to, uh, a higher level of concern appropriate to the issue. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think uh, because it's afternoon, I'm a jet lagged. I'm not going to have any filters, and I'm going to speak wonky for a second. That's OK. Uh, but I think that it's actually not a problem to get people concerned about it. I mean, I, I think that people sort of understand the issues. Now, if you flip to figuring out solutions, I, you know, part of the answer, frankly, is, is politics with a big P. I mean, these are resources that need to be governed, and there's no way around it. And we have a bit of a tendency to think of resources as susceptible only to marginal economics, meaning, you know, the price of the thing you pay captures mostly the cost of what you're doing. And the fact of the matter is that water, like some others, yeah, roads and others, is actually not like that. It doesn't function that way. It's not, it's not well managed through those processes. And it requires a state or a community to take ownership of the problem and set up institutions that intermediate both this generation and the next, the average costs and the marginal value of the services. Um, it's been done before. Uh, it's, uh, it's just difficult and it does require the public sector to play a really, the public sector or the community, so sovereign or sub-sovereign, to play a very prevalent role, which is not fashionable these days, but un unfortunately it has, to, it has to be. All right, thank you very much, appreciate it. Yeah. So earlier we were talking about the, um, Andrew was talking about the, uh, the diminishing middle class and the, and the income disparity that goes along with that. Uh, Nathaniel Smith, our next guest, comes from the city of Atlanta where he's looking at great disparities in income and opportunity and he's working on those very problems. Nathaniel, welcome to the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> So again, I, I would be remiss if I did not say thank you uh, for this opportunity to fly all the way from Atlanta, Georgia to uh, talk to you uh, this afternoon about uh, advancing towards the beloved community. Um, of course, even though I'm not in Atlanta, Atlanta is always in my heart. Um, it is a place of hope. Um, in many, many ways, people come to the city of Atlanta, in particular communities of color, uh, looking for opportunities that they feel they may not find in other places. Atlanta is also a city of courage. Um, it was the logistical home of the civil rights movement, uh, where civil, light, civil rights leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other key leaders came together to strategize about ways uh, to, uh, to buckle uh, the system of white supremacy in the American South and beyond. It is a place that has created many opportunities. It is now the cultural home of hip hop, uh, where various rappers who um, have began to influence our society reside. 
Um, I won't ask you if you know about rappers called the Migos or Gucci Mane or Donald Glover, but these are rappers that your kids, I'm sure, know. Um, so Atlanta is a very important place. As I said before, it is the home of Outkast, uh, the home of, of Margaret Mitchell, of Waffle House and Coca-Cola. Uh, it's also the home of Spanx. Uh, you may not be uh, familiar with that, but it's the home of, of many, many, many great ideas. Uh, how many folks have been in Waffle House at 3 in the morning? Uh, thank Atlanta for that. But, and it, but it's also the home of economic empowerment. Uh, for many cities around the country, the idea of economic empowerment, the utilization of public finance and resources as a way to build wealth in communities of color actually began in Atlanta with the election of Maynard Holbrook Jackson in 1973. One of the first things that he had an opportunity to do as mayor was require a 30% set aside of contracts for minority businesses and minority owners uh, when dollars were used, the building of Hartsfield International ha Airport, the busiest airport in the world, and other great infrastructure opportunities. 30% of those dollars were required to go towards businesses that were owned by people of color. The establishment, uh, they were not too happy about that requirement, but the courage of Maynard Jackson in five years moved 1% of contracts going towards communities of color to 39% in five years. It was the courage of an elected official to leverage the economic might of your municipality in order to promote economic inclusion. Maynard is a pretty famous guy and one of my heroes. But it also is the home of this other little guy, uh, me. Uh, it is a place that provided an opportunity, a platform for me to have a dream, to look at television and see an African-American mayor, uh, to go to an African-American doctor and a lawyer and, and understand that there were opportunities uh, in community for me to actually reach my full potential. Um, I had an opportunity to attend the college that Martin Luther King attended and Maynard Jackson attended Morehouse College. I had a chance to learn from that experience and be positioned in a way to understand that, that service is the rent that you pay to live on this earth. And that is the reason why I am standing on this stage. But even during that time, where I had so many role models and so many opportunities to learn from, I still would go home. And in that, pos in that situation, my family, where I lived on many occasions, had to decide on whether to pay the utility bill or buy groceries. That was my reality. I had dreams. I was told that I could achieve them. But sometimes hope and dreams aren't the only thing required in order to, be, to reach your full potential. Um, Atlanta today is booming economically. Um, our unemployment rate has decreased. Um, we're the number one state for doing business. And over 450,000 jobs have been created since 2010. Our economy is moving upward, um, but there's a problem. Unfortunately, similar to the dreams that I had, there are many young people that have dreams in our city, uh, around the country, around the American South. But unfortunately, the dreams in the eyes of many of the young people that I stand in front of you to support will not be realized because the barriers that they have to deal with every day minimize that ability for, to, for them to reach their full potential. In many places around the South and in Atlanta, a child's zip code is more influential on whether they have the chance to a, a, a achieve greatness than the dreams that they have in their hearts. So right now in Atlanta, uh, the city of Atlanta has the lowest income mobility for poor children in the nation. 94% um, of white children live in low poverty areas, while only 20% of black kids live in low poverty areas in the city of Atlanta right now. Uh, we have vacillated between one and number three for income inequality, with the number three city for income inequality in the nation. 
the median household income for African-American family is $26,000 a year, uh, while for a white family, $84,944,000. And, and we are considered, the city of Atlanta, the black mecca. Uh, but we have problems, we have challenges. Um, on many occasions, people categorize the city of Atlanta as a city too busy to hate. Um, I would augment that to say that, unfortunately, we live in a time where the city of Atlanta is a city too busy to reflect on the challenges that we're facing. And unfortunately, in the South, we're not the only city with that challenge. Um, this is a map of the e Equality of Opportunity Project that was done here at Harvard. Um, about the, in terms of uh, the economic uh, mobility of poor kids in America. And if you see where the bright red is on the map, it's in the American South. There are many, many, many young people in the American South that are trying their best. Uh, in Atlanta, a poor child only has a 4% chance to rise out of poverty. Um, that is not new or an amalgam in places around the American South. And so we have an opportunity now as we begin to think about our economy, uh, moving away from this idea of extreme extraction um, to forge ahead um, to a new tomorrow where all individuals will have a chance to reach their full potential. But in order to do that, we have to understand that in many occasions, extreme extraction, extraction also means extreme inequity. Uh, that the history of the American South uh, has stories and an unfortunate history of individuals being used to create economies without getting paid. Uh, we have a history where the push towards uh, economic competitiveness has driven certain segments of our community to not look at individuals as human beings, but as chattel. There is a connection between that and the hunger for energy and the utilization of fossil fuels to drive that um, in a way that has minimized our ability to connect as human beings and to think of ways to create not only a competitive economy, but a just economy. And that has translated into our energy systems. And we have to begin the process of changing that and acknowledging that as we move forward. We also have to acknowledge the fact that low income mobility also um, is exacerbated by the high energy burden that many low wealth communities and communities of color face in urban areas around the country. Right now in Atlanta, I mean in Georgia, uh, poor families are paying 25% of their income on home energy costs. That doesn't include challenges around housing affordability or challenges around transportation. Uh, the resource challenge is a huge one for many vulnerable populations around the American South. And so we have to understand the relationship between high income mobility or the lack of income mobility for low wealth communities and communities of color and the effects of, of, of a high energy burden on that. Um, we also have to acknowledge, and, and, and someone actually, um, my pre, the speaker that spoke before me talked about <laughs> extreme weather and the challenges that we face um, around this. Uh, five, uh, the top five biggest carbon polluters in the power sector are in the South. Um, and all of them are working really, really hard to minimize our push towards a regenerative economy. Um, we also have problems and challenges around climate disasters. Again, the South is number one um, in terms of the largest numbers of climate disasters. Um, and, and, and again, when you look at places like New Orleans, places like Houston, and even places like in Atlanta, the folks, the communities that are hurt the most are low wealth communities and communities of color. When, when some communities get a cold, those communities get pneumonia. So we have to find a way to move forward in ensuring that we can protect and elevate those communities 
and move towards creating the beloved community that I discussed earlier. And so on many occasions, people continue to push for this idea of renewable cities. We're actively engaged in Atlanta around pushing for renewable city. But we cannot assume that a renewable city will create an equitable city. Uh, there is no guarantee that that will occur. And actually, if we're not careful, becoming a renewable city can make a more inequitable city because of the challenges around the cost of new technology or how individuals may be left behind when new job opportunities arise or us not being sensitive to the entrepreneurial opportunities that are embedded in us moving towards a clean energy economy. This is a quote, quote from Jody Van Horn from the Sierra Club. She says that the clean energy economy is not immune to the broader and political trends that did disadvantage some people and reward others. All people must believe that the clean energy economy is one where their needs will be met. We have to move forward to ensure that. And if we don't, are we comfortable being able to accept the fact that we're replacing one economy that exploited vulnerable communities with a new economy that may exploit vulnerable communities? In the past, we had challenges in urban communities around this idea of urban renewal that was fairly supported and mandated that funded the displacement of many low wealth communities and communities of color. In unprofessional circles, we called it Negro removal. Places where cities leverage the resources of the federal government to displace not only individuals, but economic development owned and operated by communities of color. If we're not careful, Renewable cities could also potentially become a 21st century version of urban renewal. Communities of color and low wealth communities may be uprooted in urban areas and displaced by an inequitable energy transition. It is up to us to ensure again that this move towards a clean energy economy does not create a situation where people are pushed out as opposed to being pulled in. So our charge as a community committed to creating a more resilient and sustainable world is to work to ensure that we create not only a 100% renewable city or cities, but also cities that are also 100% equitable. We have to work to ensure that the, the cost of that transition does not burden low wealth communities and communities of color in a disproportionate fashion we have to make sure that the quality of life improvements that come from this opportunity can be shared by all. And even more important, that while other people can elevate the virtues of minimizing an energy burden associated with the transition for clean, um, for clean energy in terms of cost, which is possible, there is also an opportunity to use this transition to jumpstart economies that have been forgotten by our current market. How can we find ways to create new markets and new opportunities for people who have been left behind? So what I'm proposing to you is energy equity. It's about ensuring that the distribution of the benefits and the burdens of energy production and consumption are shared in a fair, are, are provided in a fair manner. And urban communities are the places where, cities are the places where we can start to move this energy equity agenda forward. Um, it's about sustaining the future. It's about creating opportunities where energy, environment, and economy can come together uh, to ensure that we have a comprehensive way forward where all people can participate and prosper and benefit from this transition. But it's also about what Dr. King called the network of mutuality, that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. It is our shared destiny as a community that calls and compels us to create an economy for all, to work to ensure that as we transition again, that we don't leave anybody behind. 
So the work of the Partnership for Southern Equity within the context of this space is very much focused on that. We are committed to moving uh, an economy and an American South where all people can participate and prosper, where the challenges of racial inequity and structural racism are removed and all people can come together to realize the type of Southern region that we all can be proud of. We've organized a group of leaders called the Just Energy Circle to begin the process in Georgia of moving this energy equity agenda forward. Uh, we're working to engage consumers who are usually left out of the conversation, individuals that may not know who the Public Service Commission is or integrated resource planning, but to get them to understand that as consumers, they have a right to engage in the process, to push for stronger consumer protections, and to connect the various aspects of our ecosystem in a way, our civic ecosystem in a way, that be can begin the process of moving an energy equity agenda forward. We've had a chance to bring together not only common but uncommon allies around this umbrella of just energy, whether it be the traditional groups like the Sierra Club or our, or the, or our women's interest groups or our consumer rights groups. We've been able to bring together these organizations to begin the process of working together um, to engage low wealth communities and communities of color around the energy equity agenda. They now understand that they have a part to play We've had forums and we also began the, pro we began the process of really working to influence energy policy. But again, understanding that low wealth communities and communities of color have to be at the center of an energy equity agenda. We're also working around a renewable and equitable cities initiative uh, that was enabled through a resolution that was passed by the city of Atlanta to become more energy efficient by 2035. We advocated for equity language uh, in that resolution, and now we're working with supporters like the Kresge Foundation and the Solutions Project and the Center for Social Inclusion to begin the process of organizing communities around ensuring that when we become a renewable city by 2035, we'll also be 100% equitable. Um, that is the type of work that we're committed to moving forward. Uh, we're also really, really excited about the work that Georgia Tech um, our academic anchor institutions have a role to play in ensuring that we create 100% renewable and equitable cities through the support of the Candida Fund. They are now beginning to develop the most uh, technologically advanced environmental and educational building in the Southeast called the Living Building. But they didn't just stop there. Um, by working with Georgia Tech and folks like Scansa, Skanska, they've been able to also initiate equity policies, insert equity policies like local hiring, um, curriculum design, and other key opportunities to ensure that equity is a component of the development of the living building, and it will be completed um, in Janu by January 2019. And last, but certainly not least, the work that we've had the chance to do with the Southeastern Sustainability, Southeast Sustainability Directors Network, another initiative supported by the Candida Fund, working with the Southeastern Energy Efficiency Alliance to begin the process of working with various sustainability directors around the country to create a learning cohort, a learning community, and a, a community of courage around ways that we can use the office uh, of the sustainability officers' offices to really push for not just energy efficiency, but equity within the context of their day-to-day -day policy work. So, I wanted to end with this because, you know, we, we, we're in very unfortunate times, um, times of, of hate um, and pain to a certain extent. Um, a time where we, we don't know where we may end up. And it's during those times where I, 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 I try to hang out as much as I can with my daughter because again, in her eyes, I see tomorrow. I see the possibilities of tomorrow. And, and that's love. You know, when you want the most for your young person or the people that are closest to you, but there's transformational power in that. And the transformation happens 
when you want the best for someone else's child just as much as you want for your own. And that is where we have to stand. We have to want a better tomorrow for all of us. And I'm a, a, a fan of King, and so I wanted to end with another quote, but it's, it's really powerful because King talked about power in terms of influence when he says that power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. But for this conversation, I think it has the potential to be a little bit different. I think we have the opportunity to use our changing energy systems, our clean energy economy, as a way to translate the love that we have for other people by providing opportunities for jobs, for lower bills, opportunities where we can again provide a hope, a pathway from hope to true transformation for young people who may not believe that they have a chance. We have an opportunity to do that. And so I hope that you will embrace this charge with me and play a role in creating not just a more resilient and renewable city or cities across not only the American South, but the nation, but cities that are also more equitable and just. Thank you. Daniel, one, uh, one quick question for you. Um, you talk about, uh, obviously, renewable energy is your focus. Why, having lived in Atlanta for uh, about 13 years, uh, one of the biggest issues, it seems to me, facing people there is transportation. It's, you've got a, a traffic disaster there and, and very, I would say, limited public transportation investment. Uh, do you focus on that much, and how does that fit into what you, what you just talked yes, about? Uh, we, we were actually able to organize uh, the expansion uh, of our public transportation system for the first time in 45 years um, into Clayton County, Georgia. Uh, before then, uh, suburban counties didn't want uh, public transportation in their suburban counties. And it wasn't because of the color of the buses. <laughs> um, it was because they were concerned about the color of the people who rode the buses. But it, did not, it not only minimized the opportunity for communities of color to get to opportunities that had moved out into the suburbs, but it created a horrible transportation system. Um, we all sit in traffic now as a result of that. So, so by beginning to move that, that connection point between access and mobility, climate, and also affordability. It is where PSC, where we do our work, we can really create a more inclusive community. And so, yeah, that, we, we do a lot of work around transportation equity, so. All right. Thank Good. you. Thank you, Thank you so We're much. Back up. So, Thank you. So, uh, final speaker is, uh, is going to talk a little bit about Puerto Rico and the recovery there, among other things. Is that right? Uh, Zab D'Souza Briggs and Foreign Foundation. Give him a round of applause, please. Are we at the bottom of the ninth? Is this it? Are you guys still with me? Shall we bring it home? All right. All right. Once upon a time, news outlets, business leaders, elected officials, consumers all marveled at the transformation that a great new technology would bring to each and every one of America's cities. The technology was described as magical and exciting and groundbreaking. It was poised to rescue struggling cities and to make heroes of the companies and communities that took the first big leaps into the future. And then a national magazine boasted about the city that got there first. No other city of its class in the world, they declared, was richer than Scranton. Scranton, in case you weren't aware, became that first adopter city and was touted as a model for the rest of the globe. The year was 1886, and that exciting new technology? It was the electric streetcar. Why the streetcar? Well, in the 1870s, the nation's economy was struggling there were bank panics and mass layoffs, and Scranton's economy was struggling too. Mine owners in the area cut wages, 
And when local railroad companies followed suit, thousands of workers went on strike. And yet, there was a widespread belief that the right new technology would solve every problem that Scranton and other cities were having, and that the electric streetcar was a critical ingredient. So cities rushed to put in electric streetcars. Scranton got there first, even earning itself the nickname, the electric city. Amazing, but true. And you can probably guess the rest of the story. Over a century later, Scranton is still struggling. I call it the great divergence. We have innovation hubs in this country, and we have lagging regions of many kinds. Now, this plot is figurative. It's not literal, but you could put almost any metric here, and the pattern holds. GDP, wages, jobs, patents, intellectual property, signals of innovation, a tremendous inequality between regions. And Scranton is on that lower line. In relative terms, over the last century, in fact, Scranton is lagging even further behind the so-called innovation hubs like Greater Boston, Austin, and even the former steel city, Pittsburgh, which is now a leading center of robotics and healthcare. So what went wrong? Why didn't technology and technological innovation save the day in Scranton and many other regions. Throughout history, cities have helped drive and even define human progress. And technology has always been a key ingredient. After all, it was the technology of mining and then steam engine railroads that first made Scranton a center of industry. And long before the Industrial Revolution, Innovations like written language and bookkeeping, yes, bookkeeping, produced the world's very first cities. They were crossroads of trade and government and centers of religious and cultural expression. Yet over and over again, as a prescription for what ails our cities and by extension our societies, we have embraced a tech optimism. Here they come. And that has proven not only to be short-sighted, but to be downright dangerous. Now, we've talked about optimism and views of technology today in several sessions. And I'm not indicting technology here or uh, indicting faith in technology or the belief in what it can accomplish under the right conditions. I'm calling out a particular kind of love affair and belief that technology can solve all our problems, and especially persistent problems of inequity and injustice. We're especially addicted to this tech optimism in America. What with a love of innovation, and this in spite of the fact that each major wave of innovation brought with it new inequities and injustices, not to mention new political and ethical dilemmas, some of which we've talked about today, about concentrations of power, about privacy, about the reach of markets, and much more. This mom is part of the Silicon Valley's homeless worker population. She and her daughter live in their truck because there is no housing in the area that they can afford, because the only affordable places to live are hours away. This family's story is a visceral reminder that as a country, we have indulged our love of technology right alongside a tolerance for great inequality. So rather than getting better, inequality has actually worsened dramatically over the last generation. And technology has played a role in pulling us further apart. As Andy said earlier today, I don't want to depict technology as, as the sole culprit by any stretch. But technology has, has played a role because of the way we've pursued innovation. So what makes us think that we're just a new innovation away from transforming these recurrent patterns, the things we see over and over again in different generations, from creating the kinds of inclusive cities and regions that will let 21st century nations survive and even thrive in the ways that we hope? If we really want to transform the future of cities, to fix what ails them, and to model in the more just city the just society, the real answer isn't 
some new innovation, not innovation per se, it's rather a new approach to innovation, inclusive innovation, by which I mean the intentional pursuit of innovation that by its very design and adoption advances equity and justice as core human values. One more time. The intentional pursuit of innovation that by its design and adoption advances equity and justice as core values. Inclusive innovation does the following. First, it centers the challenges of equity and justice. And second, it ensures that innovative new tools and practices aren't just compelling, but actually constructive in resolving those challenges of equity and justice. So the essence of inclusion is taking concrete steps to promote that change, not just endorse it as a value. And I'll give you a couple examples in a moment. The key steps are the, the centering that I referred to, but also the concrete application of innovation to things that affect our lives in big ways, like getting access to credit, or clean water, or energy, education, job opportunity, getting around affordably and reliably to the people and places we need to reach, understanding public issues, and making all of our voices heard in this society as clearly and as fairly as possible. All of these things and more are especially crucial and hard to attain for the most marginalized in this country and frankly in, in every country. And I want to take you to several for at least a few minutes. If inclusive innovation is going to promote a more just and equitable world, it has to be applied creatively and boldly in a wide range of areas. I want to emphasize three. These are three that help define successful cities and the larger societies that cities animate. And one of them we've already begun to explore today, jobs or the future of work. But I also want to talk about mobility and democracy because they help to give cities character. They help to define how cities function and how they dysfunction as well. So I want to share with you briefly some models of inclusive innovation at work in each of these areas. Let's first look at mobility. This is shorthand for the huge task of getting people where they need to be, when they need to be there, at a reasonable cost, over and over and over again, across an urban region. It's a big task. Here's our first example. In the Denver region, Mile High Connects is an initiative that applied the most advanced thinking in transportation planning, including the idea that multiple modes of mobility like walking, biking, driving, taking the train, the planners call multimodal thinking, that it should connect um, people around the city, and these should connect to each other. They've applied that principle along with the inclusion principle that the transportation grid should reach everyone and actually empower them to get things done in their lives. So that means improvements organized around what the most disadvantaged users of the system need, especially low-income people and the elderly, tied to specific changes to expand access to good education, health, job opportunities, and more. On one hand, it's incredibly simple, and on the other, it's a radically innovative value proposition, when you think about it, for a region's transportation system. This is how they define their mission, quote, fostering communities that offer all residents the opportunity for a high quality of life. That's the transportation system declaring that as its mission. And it's a mission that hinges on inclusive innovation. Or take Medellin, Colombia. It was once, it was long, the violent epicenter of the hemisphere's uh, drug trafficking. In Medellin, uh, community leaders and their elected officials have prioritized public investments in the poorest, least connected parts of the city. Combining mobility innovations, like escalators up to poor hillside neighborhoods, and cable gondolas with state-of-the-art libraries and public plazas and other public investments, Medellin tore up the old model of the city, a model in which poor communities were invisible, literally off the grid. Instead, these communities are now destinations to be visited and learned from. 
so much so, in fact, that the Wall Street Journal, usually a skeptic when it comes to well-meaning public investment, highlighted Medellin as one of the five cities in the world that are leading the way on innovation. And there's the example of Curitiba in Brazil, where a daring young mayor named Jaime Lerner found a way to provide broad mobility access in a low-cost, technologically creative way, decades faster and many millions of dollars cheaper than building a subway or a rail system. Lerner and his team invented bus rapid transit, which is now being adopted in many urban regions around the world, even LA on the right side of your screen. The key here isn't just the technology, like dedicated high-speed lanes or sensors and reimagined high-capacity boarding stations like the one on the left. The real key is the commitment to making these technologies and the mobility system as a whole work for everybody. That's inclusive innovation. But urban regions, as we all know, they don't work, literally or figuratively, without the engine of jobs and market demand. So what does inclusive innovation look like in this arena? Let's start with this premise. And we talked about this earlier today, or we got started earlier today. It does not mean just adopting artificial intelligence or automation that can eliminate or radically transform work and mean a different future of work. Inclusive innovation also means the resourceful pursuit and use of technology to create new and meaningful jobs and job access. Take, for example, the Positive Platforms Initiative. It's led by the Institute for the Future. Yes, there is one in the Silicon Valley. This is an effort uh, to work with experienced coders and entrepreneurs to design worker-centered models for next generation platform businesses. Related, again, to the conversation we had earlier. It's an effort to push and enable the Ubers and the task rabbits of tomorrow to build in security and opportunity for those who do the hard frontline work. That's what positive platforms is all about. Another example is in Detroit, where locally driven entrepreneurship, not just attracting uh, big companies from outside the city, is vital to help the city's economy rebound. Now the challenge is making sure that tech-enhanced opportunities aren't just available to the so-called creative class flooding the city, but also to native Detroiters, people who were there in the city through thick and thin. Let's be clear, Detroit has come a long way and still has a long way to go. The key is that its leaders are more and more intentional about inclusion as technology helps transform their region's economy. It means not taking for granted that a rising tech tide, so to speak, will lift all boats. And finally, in Johannesburg in South Africa, where youth unemployment is a staggering 40%, the Harambe Accelerator is connecting tens of thousands of disadvantaged young people to good jobs each and every quarter these are jobs with career paths, not a dead end. And Harambe is using innovative skills assessments and mapping out where new technologies are taking employers sector by sector across the region. They're not steering young people toward yesterday's job demand, but they are aiming to reach half a million disadvantaged young people. So they're thinking not only about inclusion connected to innovation, but they're thinking at a very great scale. It's amazing and it is urgently needed. But here and finally, here's a different imperative. In some ways, it's the most challenging of all. We need inclusive innovation to strengthen democracy. And local democracy in cities as well as small towns is a crucial place to start. But for now, even though we're decades into the information revolution, we're off to a very slow start. There's so much more to be done. So far, we've seen most technologists and city leaders race toward e-government. What you see here are a few of Boston's mobile apps to help residents communicate with City Hall, to tap information anywhere at any hour. And I could show you the same, not only for New York, 
um, and New Orleans, but for Rio and Mumbai and Singapore too. E-government is mainly about efficiency. It's transactional and there's nothing wrong with that. It aims to save time and money and sometimes to empower people to give them more control with basic information, information that can be even life-saving, and that's fantastic. But e-government has little to do with identifying and tackling the big shared problems we face in our public life in democratic societies. And in many cases, when they speak of public engagement, what cities are pursuing is little more than a kind of online suggestion box, a way to crowdsource ideas and opinions. It's a very narrow way to think about what democracy can mean, in part because crowdsourcing is terrific, but for a very limited class of problems, mostly technical problems. By contrast, here's what they're doing in the city of Porto Alegre in Brazil. Tens of thousands of people participate every year in learning about the best ideas that are competing for public investment. They then debate what's fair and smart, because that's important, and they make decisions together for how to allocate a big part of the local budget. It's called participatory budgeting, and leading scholars of democracy have called it a form of empowered participation. They highlight that we need empowered participation in a world of polarized politics and declining trust in decision makers and public institutions of all kinds. Here's what's really impressive, though. This is a photo of Porto Alegre, not last year or five years ago. That's 1989. They've been operating this for over a generation, and it has begun to spread around the world. It's everyday people getting a taste of what governing themselves is really like. And this particular Brazilian innovation has had a big impact on local trust in public institutions and the amounts of money targeted to public investments in the city's poorest neighborhoods. Which means it's about engaged citizenry, but it's also changing visible outcomes on the ground. And now, New York City has adopted a version of participatory budgeting that allows residents to vote on funding decisions using online and mobile technology. It's a start, but you have to admit, it's an awfully slow start for a country, our country, that is so quick to offer the rest of the world advice on both democracy and technology. So what does all this mean for how we should think about the choices ahead? Just a few weeks ago, London revoked Uber's license. It's been a little more than a few weeks now, a couple months ago now. London revoked Uber's license to operate in what is, by any measure, one of the world's most prosperous and influential cities. Some people hailed the move as a victory for taxi drivers and their wages. Others attacked it as undermining a lifeline for the British people who rely on Uber as an affordable and a convenient way to get around. Still others said the decision was undermining London's reputation as a, quote, home for innovation. Most of the debate centered uh, on that contrast, and it pitted those outcomes against each other as though it was impossible to have innovation alongside economic inclusion, mobility for all, participatory democracy. But that's a false choice. And it's a choice that is as dated as the streetcar. The streetcar, let's remember, was part of that first era of tech optimism and triumphalism in America, the industrial era, with factory cities and skyscrapers and other engineering wonders that promised the city of the future for everybody. Then came the second era, following the Second World War. Americans lived through the Cold War, the space race, the early computer revolution, with new appliances and automation, as well as the magic of television that was going to thrill, educate, and connect us all. Both of these eras promised not just to change everything, but to change everything for the better and for all of us. But tech innovations didn't fix all our problems, and in fact, they helped amplify and accelerate some of our most persistent problems of inequity and injustice. Now we're in the early days, the still early days, 
of our third great turn. Let's call it a great turn around the wonder wheel of technology. An age promising smart cities filled with smart everything. From ride sharing and driverless cars to electronic voting to decentralized co-working. It sounds all too familiar. Do we really think that magic will work as promised this time? The history lesson here is pretty simple. Technology is not the magic answer to our problems. It never has been. But placing equity and justice at the heart of the process of innovation, the relentless march of innovation, that's a bold answer. That's inclusive innovation. And we have only begun to tap its potential. Thank you very much.